Good afternoon. Otherwise, there's no lunch, huh? So, <laughs> you're going to have free lunch. You're going to have to warm up. All right. Uh, listen, I hate to be the one between you and, and lunch. I saw the program. It says we're supposed to start at 11.36. They were so precise. It wasn't even 11.35. It says 11.36. But here we are at 12.30. So, what we're going to try to do is uh, make it worth your while. I was given a task of discussing heavy stuff right before lunch, so I, I don't know what they were thinking when they organized this thing. Anyways, before I call the panels, the panelists, I was just wondering, I don't know if it's up there on the screen or not, but the panel is called Policy Regulation and Governance for a Dynamic Finance Sector. So it's a continuation of what we just discussed this whole morning. So if you like the questions, I wrote them. If you don't, the organizers did it, so okay. Now, let me, let me get started in the order that was given to me. And as I said, the topics, the, the session is titled Policy Regulation and Governance for a Dynamic. And you can see it's a mixture of insurance people, professionals, and people from the bank, and regulators as well as uh, the private sector, okay? So uh, I'm gonna start with Ato Belay, okay? Is that okay with you? And I think hopefully you've seen the question that was sent to all of us. I'm going to start at, I'm going to read it really, to be honest, so that we were on message. And it says here, for many years, and I know the insurance people earlier were, were well, the person who was articulating <laughs> about insurance wasn't very happy about the regulations, at least the regulator not being independent and all that. So my, my question to you is, for many years, Ethiopian insurance have been very much concerned and then have been very vocal uh, about the need for an independent governance mechanism. And if you can just pick up on actually what was being said in the earlier panel and give us your take uh, where we are, what do you think about an independent regulator, and just your general view about the regulation of the insurance industry in Ethiopia. You have two minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh... I must be clear, I must make clear that I'm here on my personal capacity. So anything I forward would be considered my personal view. Okay. So regarding the establishment or importance of uh, uh, an independent quote-unquote uh, insurance regulator, yes, there is no question about that. Uh, not only the insurance industry, uh, many individuals, including me, as an insurance professional and who have been, who have uh, very much concern and stake in the development of the sector, have been trying to put forward the idea of having uh, an insurance regulator which is uh, very much uh, capable and effective to lead the industry and bring the very much uh, uh, desired growth and benefit to the general economy. So as far as uh, having this uh, regulatory uh, structure outside the central bank, the issue has been uh, on the public forum, but this time around, the national bank, including as you have earlier uh, at the uh, opening session, as we have all heard from the, His Honorable Minister of Finance, that the issue have been brought to the attention of the decision makers. Actually, I cannot tell you, and I have no idea about whether there is a timeline for the decision, but what I know actually is it's uh, presented to the decision makers, and we hope there will be uh, a decision. Uh, a decision would be made in the not uh, long run. The second question is: uh, Is the insurance part of the plan to open uh, for foreign investment? Yes, uh, I believe. Even if uh, I don't have the actual the documents, it's. Uh, uh, Commonly known these days that the finance sector is not only about the banking sector, the, the finance sector in general would be open for 
foreign competition, so insurance should not be an, ex an exception, and that is uh, obvious, it would be part of the opening up. Uh, I'm trying to answer all of the three questions. Even the ones that I didn't Let's ask. Yeah. Okay, very good. Because I already <laughs> have them with me. So the right. last question is, what is your advice to Ethiopian insurers to prepare for the dynamism in the finance sector and opening up? In fact, uh, since we don't have the timeline when the sector would be going to be opened from the... Uh, the atmosphere, I don't think it would take too much time, but it's not the right time for me to advise the insurers what to do and what not to do when our guests or international competitors are preparing themselves to join the market. In any case, the first thing is to draw realistic strategy if they have the time. So we need to understand the urgency, and every company has to make the right decision and draw realistic strategy. I don't want to go to, into the details, but it is time to think about. That is the major, this, this should be the major concern of every insurance company. It equally applies to the central bank and the insurance supervision. We have to be prepared. We have to have uh, a plan how to cope with the challenges that are coming with the opening up of the industry. Thank you. This is what I like. You, you answer questions you haven't even been asked, and you, that's, that's a good way of approaching it. Um, so I'll continue the same line of thinking about regulations, but this time I'm going to ask the chairman of the association, who also happens to be the CEO of Nala Insurance, um, what, what do you believe should be the regulatory environment, uh, obviously, we've talked about it needs to be independent. There was no timeline indicated by uh, Atobelai, but just give us your thought, both as a company, the head CEO of an insurance company, a big one, but also as the head of the Association of Insurance Companies in Ethiopia. And then you can also anticipate my second and third questions and, and answer them. So uh, to add it, the question is for you. Okay, uh, thank you, Atuza Marina. I'll be as brief as possible because this issue has been discussed the whole morning. Um, the Association of the Peninsular has done a rigorous study on the regulatory framework of in Ethiopia. And uh, the study has shown that the independence of regulatory framework of Ethiopia is overdue. You asked about the timeline. We need it yesterday, not even today. So a lot of people, even uh, some of our brothers from the bank industry are curious why. This is not, um, this is not about, this is about requesting how to understand our industry. Insurance is different from banks. It has got its own purpose, business model, risk. So. We need someone to understand our entity. We always are trying to wear our big brother's suits. We need to have something that's tailored to us. So regulation, uh, Fukro has, has, has shown us, independent regulator means the ability to, to do without the undue influence of uh, government, industry, or other related interested parties. Regulatory. Uh, Independence can be demonstrated, at least in four pillars, he said. Uh, regulatory independence, uh, su supervisory independence, budgetary independence, even operational and institutional framework. Do we have that? Anybody can answer this? We don't have it. So we need to work on towards that. And we need it yesterday. And uh, we have been listening uh, what we call is a music to our ears that a lot of uh, policy orders are sta starting to look into that uh, now. So we are happy and uh, hopefully it will be implemented very soon. Uh, your next question, Atuza uh, Medina, is about the opening up, up of the insurance industry. I'm going to talk about still about the insurance industry. Of course, it is bundled with the uh, financial industry, but 
uh, here, yes, we have, I've said it all also earlier, we need it, we wholeheartedly support the opening up of the Ethiopian insurance industry. What we mean by that? Already, 60% or more than that percentage of our business has been covered by international uh, insurers and reinsurers. I'm sure everybody knows his. We are a direct insurers and our insurers are there. There are also retrocession, what we call uh, insurance of reinsurers. So only the direct aspect, the direct coverage policy of uh, risk uh, transfer mechanism has been done only here. The rest has been done already in Ethiopia. Let me give you uh, just an example. The, our uh, uh, Renaissance Dam, more than 95% of Renaissance Dam has been covered by the international insurance. We are only underwriting the policy, of course, uh, by integrating with uh, our big brother EIC. So the point here is, yes, uh, opening up of the industry is a very important issue, but it has to be a step by step and a phased approach. You don't have to just invite everyone to mess up the industry. For instance, in our, uh, in our industry, it's better first to introduce life insurance because we are not good at life insurance. We have proven track record that the other industry is a better in terms of capacity, knowledge, knowledge transfer, technology, so that whenever you invite international market, number one, we are not happy with the protectionism. We are going, you know, we are condemned to grow thin and thinner every year. Even we are not allowed to invest our money. Uh, my brother, uh, Mr. Belay, will agree with me that I, I, we are not even allowed to put, uh, we have 100 births in our pocket, an insurance company. You are not allowed even to put it in one pocket. Put the 50% in your pocket, front, 50% in your back pocket, and the remaining 25 must be in the drawer all the time. And inflation is has eating up our, even we are not allowed to invest our own money. So that's where we want to emphasize that. This industry has to be liberated. It has to be independent. Um, we want to compete. And it is good even for the customer, for the general public. We, we want to survive and thrive by competing, by defeating. But now we are condemned, we are not uh, you know, uh, growing from year to year. We are cutting, uh, our competition is cutthroat. Our motto is, our cheapest, we are the cheapest. And instead of just creating a value to our customers, so we need to go out from this cocoon. We need to redefine our industry. We have to move on. This is my uh, answer to your question. Thank you. Excellent. Um, if there was a stenographer, like, you know, in those movies where there's a court recorder, I would say if I was the judge, I would say, strike out the word magandal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> you might give it the wrong connotation. I know what he meant, but uh, I do agree. I think the insurance industry has always been sort of the stepchild of the financial service sector in Ethiopia, in including myself, to be honest. Whenever I talk about the financial service sector, I always say, oh, yeah, there is an insurance industry in Ethiopia, and with all due respect to especially to Arthur Yusuf's work. But it, it's about time. Uh, it needs to go. I agree about the life insurance. I have to tell you, I buy my life insurance in the United States. Uh, I would love to buy it here. It's because of the experience I had. When I first, the first car I bought in Ethiopia 20 years ago, I bought a Land Cruiser. And at that time, it was about, I don't know, 1 million bir. Okay? So I go to insure the car and the occupants in case of an accident. And this is a true story I've told many times. So they give me the full value. They insure the full value of the car, which was about a million. The occupant, if you die, they said you get 60,000 bir. And the car was insured for a million. I'm like, which one is worth more, me or my car? I mean, this is like an upside type. I'm sure things have changed since then, perhaps. But I agree with him. We need to, obviously, they both agree that it's, it's, it needs to open up. They, both, both the regulator and the CEO of the insurance company agree they need to uh, open it up. They, do, they don't know when. It uh, sounds like there's unanimity in, in their purpose. But in the interest of time, I'm going to move to a sector that at least I know fairly well, which is banking. And the person sitting right next to me is the head guy who controls your life, right? And he's the one who sends out all those notes all the time, including to our bank, <laughs> okay? 
So, uh, so Fraser, I'm going to ask you. Uh, listen, I'm very excited about all the changes that are taking place in the financial service sector, in particular in the banking sector. So I remember I was at the opening of the, the ceremony of the CBE building, that really impressive building. So sitting there and all the government officials and the PM was sitting in front of us. And then when he got up and he started talking about, you know, yeah, we decided to open up the sector. I was like one of those applauding like big time, right? I mean, it's like we are going to allow foreign banks in Ethiopia, which is something we've all been discussing for years and years and years, and finally it's happened. The only thing he didn't say is when. He didn't put a timeline, but it sounded like it's about to happen. So this is big, big, big change, right? So the question to a friend here is, you know, tell us, what changes, new regulations, including the opening up of the banking sector, when is it going to open to foreign banks, and any other new exciting regulations. We have all the stakeholders here. We have television cameras up there. There's going to be posted on the website, so you have to be on the record. Your other colleague, he said he was expressing his personal views. I don't know how you can express a personal view when you're the regulator, but maybe Fraser can do the same gymnastics. I don't know, but still. It's up to you, okay? You tell us what's on your mind, and um, we're all ears. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm very happy to see that at least uh, uh, the banking sector has been annexed under insurance, at least on this forum. <laughs> so that's a good development. Uh, and now back to the questions. Yeah, I think there are uh, a number of important and promising developments that are going on in the policy, legal, and regulatory uh, aspect of the financial sector. Uh, to what extent they are promising, it depends on where you are seated and from which angle you are seeing it. But at least from the promotion of the overall, you know, growth and development of the banking sector, there are a number of, you know, uh, developments that are going on. So the first one is, as you know, uh, the National Financial Inclusion Strategy has just been refreshed. And according to this strategy, uh, this strategy envisions that at least 70% of adults will be included uh, by 2025. So this is a big uh, development, and I hope that the banking sector have a crucial role to play on that space. The other major development that, that we are witnessing is, you know, there are uh, a number of inclusion of you know, non-bank players coming into the financial system, notably, you know, especially on the mobile money market and on other fintech. So from changing the competitive landscape and other issues, it's a big development. It's not only you know, the business of being a bank or uh, an insurance company or so. So there are other new actors that are coming up and you know, engaging in the provision of uh, financial services. So this is a big development. And it all changes, you know, all the competitive landscapes that we have accustomed to. Uh, the other big development that we are seeing, especially on the banking sector, is, uh, as you know, you know, the regulator has changed or increased you know, the minimum capital that's required for banks from 500 million to 5 billion. So this is a big development in terms of allowing the existence of, you know, strong, well-capitalized banks that are able, you know, to enhance their lending capacity uh, significantly. So there is a big uh, assignment on the part of the banks to comply with this uh, new capital requirement. So this is also another development. Uh, the other new thing that we are witnessing over the past years is that you know uh, the movable collateral asset registry system has been you know operationalized. So this technically will mean that normally banks are accustomed you know to provide lending based on the conventional collateral types such as lands, buildings, and uh, you know uh, vehicles. But according to this new scheme, the, the, the lending you know, model of banks has to be changed in such a way that they shouldn't only look for you know, this conventional type of you know, collaterals, rather they have to also focus on movable collaterals ranging from cattle, you know, household items, warehouse receipt financing, and et cetera. So at least you know, the regulation also requires the banks at least 5% of you know, their annual loan disbursement has to be provided using these you know, movable items as collaterals. So this is also a big development in terms of you know, changing uh, the lending model that the banks have been doing in the past. Uh, the other new development that we are seeing is you know, the introduction of Sharia-compliant uh, interest-free financial institutions into the market. 
So as you most know, so far there are two uh, interest-free banks that have joined the market and they are doing good. And there are also another three that are coming up to join the market. And it's not just only to the banking sector, but we are also hoping that you know, similar institutions will come in the insurance sector and on other financial service providers and even to the capital market, like the model that we have been uh, witnessing in Malaysia, where there is a dual system where the interest-free banks and the conventional banks you know, operate their businesses side by side, contributing for the overall development of the financial system. And another interesting, you know, uh, development that's ca coming up is, you know, the introduction of capital market to this country. So as you know, the capital market regulatory authority has already been established through proclamation and, uh, you know, uh, now establishing the capital market itself as a project is going on. So this will bring important, you know, opportunities and to some extent challenges for the bankers. So as you know, the banks are the ones that have, you know, significant public interest. And relatively speaking, they are in a better uh, position when you compare them across the different, you know, companies that we have in this economy. So they are expected to be the ones that will, you know, list their share in the market at phase one. So from that aspect, there, this is a big, you know, opportunity for them. And there are also other new institutions that are supposed to come up, like, you know, investment banks and other, uh, uh, you know, operators. So they will have their role on that aspect. So these are the big, you know, developments that you are witnessing in the banking sector. With regard to the liberalization of the banking sector, I have to be clear that, you know, as we speak, uh, the financial sector, particularly the, the banking sector, is closed for foreign investment. But there are, you know, different discussions uh, that are going on on liberalizing the banking sector to foreign uh, investors. So this is a, a work in process. But as I said, uh, up to now, the banking sector uh, is closed for foreign investment but you know that doesn't mean that you know it will it will remain closed indefinitely so it will be a wise and a pretty good uh, expectation to consider that at some point in time the banking sector will be uh, liberalized for foreign investment and all the players in the ecosystem have to prepare for that through different you know uh, strategies and uh, mechanisms so as to my knowledge uh, no decision has been made on the timeline of, uh, you know, liberalizing the sector, when, and also on the modalities, you know, the type of, you know, entry modalities that you are going to pursue when you allow, you know, foreign international banks to come into the market. Thank you so much. So that's a lot, right? A lot of things are happening, exciting things. Um, I like the fact that your target is 70% coverage in the next four years, right, uh, for financial inclusion, fantastic. The focus given on technology to achieve that is also very good. Um, the finally, finally, hopefully, the stock market will be established. Uh, you didn't give us a timeline, but perhaps maybe next year, 23, early 2024. Can we put you on the spot? Not really. Not really. Uh, these people have gone to training how to avoid answering specific dates. But let's just assume it's 2024, I, I would guess. But I still want you to give us an indication. You said you, there's no timeline, but the decision has been made. That's the most important part is the decision has been made to open up the, the banking sector. Is that correct? Is that an accurate statement, Fraser? A decision has been made to open up the sector to for, I was there when, when the prime minister said it, so you, you can't backtrack, right? I mean, I was there, I have the video actually, I tweeted it. So give, I mean, you can't say it hasn't been decided. It's just a mechanism, right? I just I'm trying to get clarity. It's just the how to and when has not been decided, right? I mean, the guy is very very cautious, so I don't know. How, yeah? Okay, I mean, listen, I we we've heard it from the big guy himself, right? So we take it as a policy decision. It's just we agree. The time we heard there are committees being set up. That, that's fine. We just don't know what the timing is, right? And the, the modality. Could it be, as was said earlier, could, is it like China did 19.99% 19, 19 initially, or could it be, oh, come on in, whatever. We, at the very least, for me, the exciting part is the decision has been made. That, that's a fair statement on capital markets and all these, the use of technology, the emphasis. The, the last point I want to ask you, though, is what's your position about consolidation in the banking sector before or as part of the opening up. You, does NBE have any position on that? 
do you know why I say that? With all due respect, five billion is no longer a big amount, right? We all agree. For the size of the economy that we have, which is the third largest in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, I, I know um, I'm talking to bankers here who may not be that, that excited, but do we really need 18, uh, with all due respect, small banks? And I'll tell you something, as a coincidence, today I'm, I'm a judge. Every year for the last seven years, I've been a judge at the Africa Bankers Award. In fact, I'm sending in my final ranking today to London, okay, because we got the package. For the last seven years, when I get the package of shortlisted banks, the first thing I do is go through and see if there are any Ethiopian banks. Seven years I've been disappointed. Not a single Ethiopian bank has been shortlisted. I'm sure there are good banks here, maybe you don't submit, but the fact is also a reflection when I see the performances of Nigerian banks, South African banks, I mean, even the way they write, you know, they're, they're very good at writing, right? We're, we may not be that good, but you all need to understand where the world is, right? So I'm just asking, it's five billion, what is it now? That's less than a uh, hundred million dollars at today's exchange rate, and that's five years from now, right? Imagine, five years from now, it might be 10 million dollars at the exchange rate five years from now. So I'm, I'm, I'm just asking, you know, what's your view about consolidation in the banking sector in Ethiopia? Okay, thank you. Uh, I think the five billion per capita requirement is just a minimum entrance requirement. So once this uh, is pursued, there will be an ongoing capital requirement from the bankers. So based on the risk profile of each and every bank, banks will be required even to have higher capital based on the risk profile of each individual bank. So the, the five billion is just a one-time entrance requirement. After that, there will be a continuous assessment of the risk profile of each and every bank. And based on that, banks may even be required higher capital than that one. So that's the one remark on the capital uh, amount. The second thing is on uh, you know the issue of consolidation of uh, banks if, when the market is liberalized. I think uh, it all depends on the entrance modality that the government is going to adopt. So I don't think that the government will adopt a kind of you know, modality where the local banks will be wiped out by international you know, competitors. So that will not be the situation, but still, you know, given you know, the situation at hand, you know, there are the issue of you know, one bank acquiring another and other banks getting consolidated is still on the table, and it will be purely you know, the business strategy of each and every individual bank. So if they believe that you know, they can survive and swim, then up, that, that's up to them, given that they will fulfill you know, all the legal requirements that are being you know, required by the central bank. So mo for me, it's more of you know, a, a, a business decision left for the banks. So in other words, there won't be forced mergers. I, I, that's my translation, okay? Now, I have two more very prominent panelists. Uh, the order I was given says I have to go to ask Ato Malaku first, and then I, come, I guess the anchor, the closer is Ato Yesu's work. So let me go to Ato Malaku. Uh, obviously, you run one of the biggest banks in this country. Uh, you have the most, one of the most beautiful buildings, I have to say. I was there recently for the first time. Very impressive. So pick up on what uh, Fraser said and give me your thought about the opening up, okay? Foreign banks coming in, good, bad, indifferent. What, just share with us, you'll probably be one of the winning banks, in my view, <laughs> if the market opens, but it will be good to hear from you, okay? Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, just after we hear from our PM on the announcement of uh, foreign banks uh, to come to Ethiopia, that was what we are expecting uh, to come, uh, but still we don't know the time plan or the roadmap as to when it actually starts and uh, with what type of modalities are they going to come. But for me, uh, I accept it as a positive impact to the banking industry in Ethiopia. Uh, at the beginning, we might have some challenges, like um, the experience that we had in uh, Kenya uh, 20 years back, there was a challenge. But later on, I strongly believe that the local bankers with having a local trust, trust in a banking industry is uh, the bigger asset that we are left with. 
So the local trust and local wisdom will definitely help us uh, to compete with uh, foreign bankers. And we should not forget that those foreign bankers have their own strategy also to partner or work together with local bankers with equity participation. That definitely will bring certain capital increase and uh, technology adoption and also uh, uh, having uh, advanced human capitals. Uh, this uh, phenomena definitely will, have to, uh, will affect two domains. One is uh, private banks, and the other is the government, central bank, and those policy banks, the two policy banks, CB and the development bank. For private banks, I would say it's rather an opportunity that will create us uh, a good competition uh, platform because uh, closing this in the industry for a long period of time is it, going to not work because right now we can see the, the resource uh, mobilization schemes that are working in terms of foreign currency, local currency, and the like. So this has to be opened up to the foreign industry to work with us. Uh, some of them, uh, as we contacted with some of the banks, they are preferring to work with local banks, not, no, not necessarily working as a standalone bank here. But I would say more than the challenge that we have on a private bank, I expect more challenges will come to the government central bank and private, uh, those policy banks because they have to adapt themselves to control uh, these uh, foreign banks, how things are going to be managed. They, may, they might not have a freedom of you know, issuing a directive just within a day or whatever to restrict some of the things because those foreign banks are not shy enough like uh, the local banks. Uh, I hope this will not uh, irritate our uh, regulators because uh, as as it is saying in Amharic, so I hope our bosses will not be, uh, you know, uh, emotional on this. But I would say, I would say the central bank has to manage somehow the mindset, the capability, and the like. I'm not saying independency or mercantile or whatever, but I'm saying within the central bank framework, things has to be changed. There, there might need also sometimes to bring new ideas from other sectors and uh, include on central banks. Because sometimes when you are dealing with in one company for a long period of time, it will be hardly possible to, to have or to accept changes. So I would say more than the challenges that we are going to have, the central bank and policy banks who have much local restriction, other than the foreign restriction, there are also local restrictions where private banks cannot work uh, as compared to the uh, policy banks. Those has to, you know, uh, see ahead of the time. On the other side, uh, I would say uh, it will be ideal or good if we know the roadmap as to when the foreign bank is going to open. Particularly, I, I, I expect the current macroeconomic situation that we have has to be controlled, particularly the inflation and so on, because the way that we are facing right now is earlier the, the financing amount, for, for example, for an individual exporter, if, if we finance a certain amount of money that, uh, that customer used to buy, let's say, three containers of coffee and so on, now they can buy only one container. So the demand on the customer side is very much high as compared to the supply that we have, including the local currency, not only the foreign currency. This is a very challenging, that crisis uh, based on the inflation that we have. And the other one is, um, I expect in the roadmap that's going to be laid down, we need to have a phased approach as to how we bring those foreign banks to the local uh, to the domestic business and in what domain are they participating on corporate park banking or retail banking? As uh, Mr. Richard mentioned, we might be good enough in retail banking reaching out those mass bases because the current statistics that we have is around 65 
percent of the adult community is still unbanked. So there is untapped market there where we can reach out and uh, the retail banking segment might be one of the winning tool for the local banks and those uh, bank, foreign banks who are coming as a standard might focus on few corporate customers. So there are certain things which are not clear, but I would say I am very much optimistic on this move of uh, the Prime Minister, but we don't know when uh, that's going to happen. If that is clear, I think we can make ready our service. And as you, as I might mention, a merger is also one of the possibility, like we have seen in Nigeria and other parts of the world, that four or five banks will merge and becomes one of the leading uh, bank in, in that part of the region. So that, that is a possibility. Of course, there is an inherent problem in a country where the chemistry of the shareholders in the bank is in. So it might not be so much easy to have an easy merger and the like, but definitely we have to create a synergy by you know, consolidations and so on. It should not be by force and so on, but the business model, as you mentioned, had the capital been set as 10 million or 10 billion or 20 billion, a merger would be inevitable because no one will reach that, that capital within the five years. So that type of tools the central bank can use, but I strongly believe we need to have few stronger banks than having uh, uh, many uh, you know, smaller banks as compared to other parts of uh, the neighboring countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was enlightening. And so the final comment actually aligns with my view that we need fewer banks, but bigger, right? So that's, now I come to uh, a good friend, an articulate speaker, a passionate speaker who have shared panels many, many times over the last 15, maybe even 20 years. Uh, I don't think any introduction is needed after years of work. Uh, the question here I was asked to ask you is, uh, you've often heard in public, that the playing field is not level for private banks, or let's call it private financial institutions, because he, he's on both sides. He's both on the insurance side and he's also on the banking side. But more specifically, perhaps, this morning also there was a lot of debate. Is it, why do you say the playing field is not a level one? In other words, it, it means that perhaps the state banks have a, an unfair advantage. I guess that's what you're getting at. Why do you say that? and what recommendations you have to make it a level playing field, and then talk about anything else as you normally do, but the sector. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, my dear friend, Zamedina, who have been, I have not been seeing you for some time, and, and I have been missing you, honestly. Uh, yes, we did have several opportunities where we did express our opinions as to what would be better or what would be best for the Ethiopian financial sector. Look, I, I heard Dr. Kananisa also this morning saying that they are going to start training people for the insurance sector. Am I correct? Yes. I mean, <laughs> it's amazing. Look, in 1992-93, I was officially asked by the National Bank of Ethiopia. 1992-93 is European calendar. I was not in this country. I was the chief executive of the African Reinsurance Corporation with headquarters in Lagos, Nigeria. And one of the things that I was asked then was, what is your opinion about where to place insurance supervision? And I believe a five-page letter is still in the files of the National Bank of Ethiopia today, which I sent then to Ato Leikun Brahanu, who used to be the governor of the National Bank, saying, whatever you do, please 
make sure that you do not put supervision of the insurance sector in the bank. To set up an authority, a commission, or some, some supervisory authority, which could be led by a board, with the National Bank as the chairperson of the board, but comprising of insurance professionals. That was 92, 93. And this morning, the question raised by Atoyared Mola, the president of the Association of Insurance Companies or Association of Insurers. And the response given by His Excellency, the Minister of Finance. I mean, I was smiling, giggling. I was, I was so happy. It's taken a very long time. But I think Bahagarachin owned the owner of Better, Bittmanam, and Matasabarim. Reality is finally catching up with us. But what about an Ethiopian, properly constituted, strong Ethiopian? Institute for Financial Studies, a center of excellence for this country. I remember how I fought when the idea of setting up a reinsurance company in this country came up. The discussion was at the Hilton Hotel. I had earlier presented a paper to SIP, Society of Insurance Professionals, we need a national reinsurer for this country. And when the research was made, the suggestion was to set up a reinsurance company with 250 million bir by Ethiopian Insurance Corporation. Look, I love Ethiopian Insurance Corporation because I was its first general manager. And that association will always be part of my life. But that was not the issue. I said, how can you? Sitting in Addis Ababa, the headquarters of the African Union, the headquarters of the ECA, and so many diplomatic representations, why do we have to just make it a political capital of Africa? Why don't we talk about making it a capital for business? Create a reinsurance capacity big enough to be trusted and big enough to receive reinsurance inwards from neighboring African countries. Don't think of only minimizing the foreign exchange outflow by way of reinsurance, but think of attracting foreign exchange into Ethiopia, create a bigger capacity, sell that reinsurance capacity. And at, and at least the capital was moved from 250 million reinsurance company to be set up by Ethiopian Insurance Corporation to a reinsurance company with one billion bir and to provide insurance capacity or reinsurance capacity to neighboring countries and to attract foreign exchange. I mean, the potential is still there now. At least the company is there. I'm so happy to see this. Look, in 1999, I think I was the president of the Addis Ababa Chamber of Commerce. We held the first Addis Ababa Stock Exchange Promotion Council. All right? Recently, and I'm happy to say, I was asked by the National Bank to be involved in the discussions to set up the capital market. At least the regulatory authority is set up, and 
in the not too distant future, there will be an effective capital market operating in this country. And even with a joint venture, a joint venture, experienced, you know, investors with serious experience in, in capital markets, pairing up with Ethiopian, uh, uh, the, the Ethiopian, uh, I mean, side. And that really, I mean, I think these are the kind of things that really keep me young, although the years are still counting, you know, the clock is, go is going. But Ethiopian Institute for Financial Studies, we should have it, and it is a PPP project. All right? It should be. We have to start it. I'm happy to say that we were asked to submit a preliminary concept note, and that concept note, preliminary concept note, was presented to the governor of the National Bank on about a year ago, the 5th of May, 2021. And we are waiting for something to happen. Now, regarding the entry of competitors into our market, I mean, <laughs> I thought this was going to happen 15, 20 years ago, or at least 15 years ago. It is late, but as they say, it is never too late to do the right thing. So we're coming. And this morning, was it Ardak who said how the Chinese opened their market? I think if I heard her right, 19.5% participation, equity participation to the entrance, the foreign entrance. I thought this was going to happen about four years ago when suddenly National Bank said, hey, diaspora Ethiopians, you are, you are owning shares in insurance companies and banks in this country. This is illegal. You have to sell your shares to the banks and insurance companies at par. After they have been holding these shares for 10, 15 years, if they were to sell them outside or to somewhat to an Ethiopian, they would have earned the premium, which turned out to be 50, 60, even 100%. National Bank said no. You give it back to the institution, and then it will be sold on auction, and the premium will go to the National Bank. I said, for heaven's sake, <laughs> diaspora Ethiopians, they send more money to this country in foreign exchange than Ethiopia gets by exporting all the goods and services that it can. We should not irritate them. We should not make them unhappy. And besides, how did these people own these shares anyway? Do we really have the true story? Some of them, their parents held Ethiopian passports when they bought the shares. Later on, they immigrated to the US and they died. Naturally, the children got the shares. It wasn't really, they didn't, the, the, the diaspora Ethiopians did not come to Ethiopia and did not buy shares, I mean, to make illegal profits. But it is true, because I know the cases, some of them. That was what happened. So I said, please, let's take six months and the foreign minister, Dr. Tedros Adhanom, I requested a special appointment. He received me in his office 
with two diplomats with him. As this was about June, July. There was going to be a big diaspora meeting in Baghdad in six months' time. I said, look, let's take this window. Let's please change or make some changes in our regulation to let diaspora Ethiopians who now shall do, share, hold shares in banks and insurance companies, let's say that non-Ethiopians, we don't even have to say diaspora Ethiopians, non-Ethiopians can own shares in Ethiopian banks and insurance companies up to 10%, up to 15, 25%. If we do that, then we don't have to force these people to sell their shares. And we have six months to do it. He was convinced. He could not convince the National Bank, though. So it didn't happen. Right. Look, yes, the market should open. We should have been preparing for this. The last 10, 15 years, we haven't done so. But as I said, it's never too late to do the right thing. Let's start training, I mean, night and day now. And let's say that entry should not be like what happened in certain countries in the past. I think the two countries that are most mentioned are Philippines and Argentina overnight liberalization of the whole sector. The financial sector is a sensitive sector. Even Anktad said several times that a nation has to have some degree of control over its financial sector if, if resources are to be directed to priority sectors of development. So now, as I said, yes, I have listened, sir. I have been saying, if you have listened to me over the radio or in writing, I have said, well thought out, planned, phased, and sequenced liberalization. Let's allow non-Ethiopians to invest in Ethiopian financial sector companies, let's say up to, I don't care, up to 49%, at least for the next, I don't know, three years maximum. All right? After that, the capital market, the stock market will do the job. People will buy and sell their shares there. In the meantime, in these three years, the smaller banks who cannot afford to get to meet the requirements, let's get together mergers, acquisitions, inorganic growth, even for those that are well capitalized by now. Because the biggest bank, $200 million worth, Awash, which is the leading bank, which is a successful bank, by comparison, where are the rest? So we, have, we do not need all these small banks. All right? And I know also what happened in Nigeria. From 120 banks to about 20 banks, they came down. That is the way forward for me. Thank you. I told you he's a very passionate speaker with lots of ideas, always, original ideas. And he doesn't hesitate to express his views as well. This is one of the trademarks of Atoya work of the years. Well thought out, phased, sequenced, planned, uh, opening up is what he's suggesting. Suggesting, so, and I completely agree, he agrees with the M&A ideas that I have, so I, I like him even more. So now, the, the challenge I face is, my clock says 53 minutes, we've been up here, and we were given 55 minutes. So we're left with two minutes for Q&A. It would be unfair to have all these people sitting here not asking questions, especially since we have two regulators Two, three CEOs on the panel, right? So if you agree with me, I know your, your stomach is growling with food needs and nourishment. 
let's give ourselves just maybe five, six minutes to ask, you know, very quick rapid fire questions. And everybody here who gets asked will be very to the point. Can we agree on that? Or do you want to go to lunch without asking questions? It's up to you. Should we continue for five minutes? Okay. Oh, I hear the ladies saying yes. So the, the ladies come. So let's do this. Who wants to ask questions, as I said, under these rules? Right here. One. Two. Do we have any other ones? The lady who said yes, we should continue. Do you want to ask a question? No? You are doing it for others. Okay. So we'll, we'll do, and then you, you want to ask a question? Oh, you're just stretching, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. So those two questions, we wrap up. And? Oh, sorry. Uh, it says reserved. I guess that's not your name, right? So third. Okay. So those three, pre quickly, okay? And then we wrap up. Oh, there you are. Please. Go ahead. Excuse me? Yeah, go ahead. Hello? I think not now you can listen to me. So I have only one question, but that question is very fat, really. I understand that. Uh, it is to Mr. Fraser. So in terms of creating plain competitive environment, how do you see the fact that you delegated CBE only to handle the government accounts? Is that fair? Are you ready if we ask you to delegate some additional pri private funds this time to handle that? And again, there is a trend of uh, emergence of regional banks with uh, changing microfinance institutions into full-fledged banks. So is that really good in terms of, uh, again, creating this plain competitive environment. Thank you very much. Next question, it was there. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my question goes to uh, both Ato Belay and Dato Fraser. Uh, we are talking about liberalizing the sector, and we are also discussing that the type of banks and insurance companies that are currently existing are too small to withstand the competition that are expected to come. Uh, as to me, the human capital seems to be completely ignored because even in the local expansion, banks could not establish a new company unless otherwise they took a CEO from the existing one and down the line, they requires to move human resource from existing. So that is creating big challenge for existing players even in the local competition. So what is your focus? Really, are we making a planned approach to liberalize the market, given the shortcoming in our human capital? I thank you. Third question, here. Thank you very much. I think uh, mine is not more of a question, it's just to echo some of the sentiments by your speakers. My name is Jackson, I come from Kenya. I represent Nairobi Stock Exchange, and I'll be in the panel in the afternoon. But I want to say a number of things. I am happy, uh, while Kenya is struggling whether to go back to a single regulator, uh, we are considering the route that we took. Whichever route you take, the most important thing is clear separation of power, responsibility, and administration. That is as far as regulation is concerned. Number two is, should you be worried about competitors coming to your market or not? My answer is no. People do business based on value preposition. What are you providing for the market? People do business based on the technology that you are praising. How efficient is your business model? And people do business based on your customer service levels, and above that, your market segmentation. We had a similar discussion back then when Kenya was, uh, was talking about multinational banks. Today, the biggest bank in Kenya is still a native bank. It has actually grown from a microfinance, so you, have, you can do it, you can do it. So don't worry, the best that you can do is, uh, in the next phase of economic competition is about technology, is about customer service and value preposition. Whether you need uh, an Ethiopia Institute of uh, Financial Markets or Capacity Development, 
The answer is a yes. We are unlucky that uh, in the region we started the journey far away long ago. And we are we, we actually doing things backwards and then front in terms of the issues that you're discussing. The biggest contributor to one's economic prosperity as a nation will be anchored on properly structured capacity development certification programs and international standardized expertise. That will be the biggest winning game for you. And finally, whether you need a stock market or not, uh, the answer is actually double yes. I've had the speakers struggle with capital ejection when there is the new capital requirement. Whether small bank, big bank insurance, the easiest form of raising long-term capital for your compliance and expansion is through the stock markets. There is no other solution. There is no competition between capital raising for banks, capital raising for stock markets, because this is very distinct. I overheard that uh, people are struggling to invest their money in the, in the market. Uh, the solution is still the stock market. It gives you a fairly gradient, transparent mechanism of pricing yourself as an institution and also investing in a controlled environment. The next phase of challenge that is coming in is how will you be managing your pension industry? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So, um, well, well, good comments from, from our friends in Kenya. Uh, as I said, we have, we run out of time, but two questions for Hato Fraser, and then one for the insurance regulator. So if you can just start with you, Fraser, very quickly, and then with you, and we wrap up. Thank you. Uh, personally, I do believe that there has to be equal level playing field for all actors, you know, playing their role in the financial service ecosystem. And at the same time, we have to also be pragmatic in terms of understanding, you know, the specific role and mandate that public banks are provided with. So we have to balance all these issues. Otherwise, yes, you are right that it has to be equal level playing field for all actors. And the questions that you raised with regard to delegating CBE for to handle these public funds, as has been said by the, uh, from the Ministry of Finance, it can be still uh, presented for uh, deliberation. The other thing is on the on the MFIs graduating and coming into a bank. Yeah, uh, as you said, uh, right now there are some few banks that are, you know, graduating and transforming themselves into a bank. And this has uh, positive and negative sides, but personally I do believe that the positive side is, uh, you know, greater than the negative side in terms of, you know, enhancing the competitiveness of the banking sector because there has some structural limitations within the banking sector. For example, 40% of the banking sector credit is provided to less than 1,000 credit borrowers. So this is the reality that we are in right now in terms of access to credit. But at the same time, the sector has provided loans to only 350,000 clients. With just the inclusion of one microfinance into a bank, now the banking borrowers number has surpassed 1.5 million. So what it means is that these borrowers, more than 1 million borrowers, have now the liberty to use additional you know, banking service that they weren't used to while they were under the microfinance. So from that angle, there are uh, positive things. But again, with regard to you know, the type of regulation being adopted and with regard to you know, creation of equal level playing field, this has to be a serious concern for all of us to reflect. On the issue of the human capital aspect, yes, this is a very critical challenge as we see ourselves, you know, in terms of liberalizing the financial sector. So there has to be concerted effort on different dimensions. It starts from, you know, the banks themselves in terms of having clear human capital development strategy, in terms of pursuing effective succession planning, you know, the kind of, you know, uh, uh, practice that we are seeing in the banks is not good as at the moment. So whenever, you know, a, a specific CEO resigns from a bank, there is at the same time a panic being created as a bank. But that shouldn't be the way. It has to be the opposite. The banks have to worry, you know, who should take the position among the different pools that you have developed through your succession planning. So this has to be the way forward. Otherwise, you know, if, you know, the resignation of one CEO amounts to the creation of a panic in a bank, this is a pure sign of, you know, trouble in our banking system and as an institution. So for that, we have to work internally and at the same time 
we have to develop you know, training in institutions that can deliver you know, various certification and education programs. So this kind of you know, uh, efforts will address the issue you know, going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we are not talking about liberalization of the finance sector, rather it is opening up of the finance sector. Uh, that is one point which I want to mention. The other one is, yes, uh, one of the key problems of the insurance sector is the uh, critical shortage of trained, experienced, and qualified insurance professionals. And uh, that is the underlying uh, factor for many of the sector's challenges. Uh, the products are very limited. Innovation is way below the water level. And uh, particularly the underdevelopment of the life insurance part much depends on the uh, absence of qualified actuaries and insurance professionals. Uh, it's true, we uh, used to have an insurance uh, training, insurance and banking institute that was effective at the time. And unfortunately, that was not working well uh, now. And it's not, in my view, ready to cope up with the challenges of the financial sector. Uh, from uh, my personal understanding, insurance professionals to develop, uh, to grow insurance professionals, universities and academic institutions are not the right place because the experience all over the world shows that there are specialized insurance colleges or insurance institutes which produce the kind of people, professionals, that the sector requires. More or less, the insurance sector training and capacity building is a kind of uh, standardized or uniform approach. It is mainly based from the curriculum uh, developed by the Charter Insurance Institute of UK. And with some kind of modification and uh, domestication, we have to work on that. And it will take time, but we have to start now. Otherwise, we cannot expect the insurance learned over time from other markets. So it's important, and that is a key challenge. We have to work on that. Equally, it's important uh, we cannot open the market without having adequate number of uh, professionals that would be uh, that would put our uh, companies in a, a negative uh, position thank you all right so as i said at the beginning this was going to be a very exciting panel and it turned out to be very exciting unfortunately we've run out of time and we also appreciate your patience because it's way, way beyond your lunchtime. But you will agree with me, the topics we discussed were extremely relevant. We had very talented people, people in a position to make decisions on the panel, which you don't normally get. So I thought it was worth it for us to expand it a little beyond the allotted time. So let's wrap up. But before we do that, can you please give this five panelists a warm round of applause? So I understand this is the end of the session before lunch, but there's the MC somewhere, if he's here, if you can just tell us what we do next. Thank you very much for having us. Perfect. Thank you very much. I told you that this panel discussion was going to be a heck of an appetizer. I'm sure you're all feeling hungry, and thank you very much for the, for the beautiful panelists and the moderator for, for that. Uh, so now that you're really hungry, we've got uh, a whole lot of ushers outside waiting for you, ready to take you to upstairs where the lunch is. Uh, so with that, let me just make a couple of announcements. Uh, in the afternoon, we're going to uh, obey, uh, obey with some of the things we've been saying. We're going to take care of the insurance track and the banking uh, track in different ways. So for those that are joining the insurance track, uh, please uh, join the conference room number five. Uh, the first moderator will be the CEO of the